uh, would identify as alternative organizations, but most of them did not. They basically saw themselves as responding to a need um, or fixing a problem that their traditional structure was causing. Uh, so that was interesting to us as well. So when we start with high levels of trust, one of the interesting things that we found is that it came up in two key ways. It was a basis for starting this type of leadership and decision making, but it was also a result. So in other words, the process of trusting people to make decisions and going through and seeing those decisions get made resulted in higher trust and kind of higher success levels of this working. And the second area it came up in was around transparency. And this is something I think we would all love to spend a lot of time figuring out what it means and, and how you do it. Um, the main way that it came up for the people that we talked to was around access to information to make decisions, which we'll talk about, and then also budget um, and kind of funny uh, finance and money knowledge. So basically knowing the money coming in, knowing the budgets, um, knowing different parts of information that are generally held in the executive level. So the other thing that we saw in place in these organizations was an investment in learning. And this came out in a couple of ways. So number one, resources, uh, time and money. So making a commitment to invest in learning. But it was framed in an interesting way. Um, a couple of folks talked about the idea of a decision maker needing information to make decisions. So if you think of staff members at whichever level um, is involved in the decision making, needing the information um, or getting the information they need to make the best decisions. So they really thought of programs um, and information sharing in that way. What does somebody need to know to make the best decisions without going back up and centralizing it in one spot? So it seems really simple in some ways, but a lot of organizations struggled with that internal communication. Um, and we're trying to think of ways beyond staff meetings that they could share information. Um, and at the time, most of the groups that we talked to were still in kind of a meeting mode. So they were having a lot of meetings which they felt were necessary, but they were hoping to find um, some other ways to do that. So another key area that came up in terms of foundations for distributing leadership was the idea of shared values. Again, something we hear a lot about, but the way that it came up that was interesting to us is that people spoke about building a structure or a system in the organization that supports shared values. So if you think about it, again, in the format of decision making, um, it's that concept of what values do people need to know um, and what kind of mission central values do people need to know so that when they're making smaller or immediate decisions that they can make the best ones. So what do they need to know to not be able to go back? So it applies especially, as I said, to smaller immediate decisions um, that maybe program or frontline staff might be making on a daily basis. And it just is another way, again, um, to ensure some uniformity around that. So the last way that we saw, uh, the last thing we saw in place was patience and time. And when it comes to larger decisions, so you think shared values, um, sharing information, that helps people kind of make program decisions or on a daily basis. But when you think of these larger decisions that it takes, and if you think about involving more staff members and more people and volunteers in the organization, it takes a lot of time when you distribute it in that way. And all the people we talked to spoke about committing to a process so that even when it's taking that time, it actually led to better impact again. So for example, it could be internal or external policies. People brought up theory of change processes um, or other internal policies that they working, were working on, and they took time at the beginning to kind of build up that knowledge base before they started the process. And then externally, how to make decisions about who to partner with um, or supporting a bill, something that um, traditionally an ED might make that decision, but people are able to make that um, when this kind of patience and time is put into the front end of this process. So before we talk about some of the ways that people implemented this, um, we're having some volume issues, um, we're going to have you do another poll question and we'll work on some of the uh, sound issues. If you do have issues with sound and us coming in and out, please just put it in your chat box and someone will try and figure it out. Uh, we're going to do another poll question about resolving problems um, in organizations. So we're going to start with this question. It, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so if there's a disagreement about a decision in the organization, who's the most likely to resolve the problem? Francis is going to take us through this. So uh, 
if you would answer this poll question. If there's a major decision in the organization, as Caroline said, who's more likely to solve the problem, the board of directors, the ED or CEO, a senior management team, program managers, or all the staff kind of equally are involved in that. And if you could just write down what you found in, in your organization, um, we're curious what how your organization resolves some sort of major uh, disagreement about a decision in the organization or a disagreement about a major decision in the organization. And okay, so I'll give you a couple more seconds to do that. And please let us know if you're having problems with the audio. Okay, uh, for most of you, it's uh, for 16 percent of the board of directors, which is actually higher than we found in the group that we work with, though we didn't have uh, a poll to ask them that question. Uh, for for uh, many of you, uh, just under half, 46 percent, it's either the ED uh, or the CEO that does that. And for a third of you, it's a senior management team that reports directly to the executive director or CEO. Um, none of you said program managers would resolve that. and. 5% of you are in organizations where really all staff members have equal power. So let me um, take that information and tell you a little bit about how uh, distributed and shared leadership practices, so we're focusing on distributed, in other words, that the decision-making structure allows for lots of people in the organization to take leadership roles. Um, how that was implemented in the organizations that we interviewed. And again, I want to remind you, if you have a question or a problem, you can, um, or you want a, us to address something as we're talking, just put that into your chat box or your question box, and, and we'll try to answer it as we go along. So uh, there are five areas of implementation that we found especially important for the groups that we interviewed. These were embracing autonomy, having buy-in from staff, sharing information, clarifying roles, and limiting control. And I'm going to talk about each of these uh, just for a couple of minutes to give you a better sense of what we mean. Embracing autonomy was really uh, an kind of the key measure of whether groups were able to implement a shared and distributed leadership practice. And that meant that groups actually did not use an input model. Most of us come out of models, or many of us come out of models where, you know, a decision is being made in an organization and then we give input in the decision and then the person at the top level or the people at the top level make that decision and maybe may or may not get back to us about how our input influenced that decision. Often they don't get back to us on that. In the groups that we talked to that were really distributing leadership, decision-making practices were empowering staff to make decisions. But they said to staff, you make decisions, you have enough information, you have uh, enough, uh, we have shared values, we have enough trust in you to make those decisions. Now, it also meant that people um, were held accountable for the decisions they made. So there was both trust in the organization that people could make decisions, but also uh, and make the right decisions, but also there was an accountability mechanism put into place. So people weren't punished for making wrong decisions, but it wasn't like any decision you made was okay. And I wanted to just mention that these decisions often extended to program implementation, like new programs or how programs would be implemented, existing programs, and in fund development. So people might go out and raise money for a program that they wanted to implement in the organization. Again, communicating this, but they made the decision. The second area was buy-in staff. And we were surprised how often people talked about this. It was not just one group that talked about this. Several talked about that the staff really needs to buy in and believe in this model. It didn't really work when an ED or CEO said, okay, now we're going to do distributed leadership. It took a majority of the staff and eventually all of the staff to buy into the model to make it work. One example was a group we talked to where um, 
the executive director and many of the staff decided to implement a very distributed, extremely distributed uh, leadership model where teams were making decisions in the organization. And what the executive director told us when we interviewed him was that uh, there were one or two people who really resisted this model. They were worried about accountability. They were worried about, uh, they had always been in organizations where somebody approved what they did, and it took them a long time to work with these two individuals to convince them that this model, that they could, one, participate, and that they actually could do it, that they had the confidence to do it, and that they would be supported in making decisions. But th th this was a very important area. So it's not, uh, it wasn't enough to just say, okay, we're going to implement this and we're going to start having staff meetings about this. It took some individual work and support so that all members of the organization, all staffers or members, however you define that, could be uh, involved. Um, I, I was going to say one other thing about buy-in from staff. One of the executive directors we talked to, uh, she said, it's not enough being smart and effective when I hire somebody. She talked about how now they hire people to get along with other people because part of the model was really people working together. And we might think of distributed leadership as individuals making their own decisions, but actually in the organizations that we work with, uh, decisions often were made in consultation with their own teams. It just didn't mean that they went up through the hierarchy to get approval. And they talked about if they had one difficult or disruptive person, it could really, um, it could really throw off uh, uh, an organization's ability to work well. So they were always on the lookout for that, and they really hired for being able to get along with people, not just being the smartest person for the job. OK, the third area um, in implementing this model um, was sharing information. I think, you know, this is, uh, you're going to hear this again and again, that's kind of the, the challenges and the necessity to share information. Caroline talked about learning more, that the learning mode, that all groups felt like people need information to make the right decisions. And if they don't have the information, um, you can't expect them to make decisions. Often we don't make decisions because we come back saying, I don't have the full picture. So groups struggled with how to both share information so that people had enough information without um, burdening people with constant meetings, uh, especially face-to-face -face meetings, uh, to um, give them the information. We also had one group that talked to us about how um, they were really being challenged uh, but, but by having these very lengthy staff meetings because they wanted everybody to be able to have information. But several people felt like they would never make decisions in certain areas. Uh, so they were bored by these long staff meetings. So they were revising that. So there was always a balance between efficiency and being efficient and conveying information. Some groups did this very well through using um, uh, uh, non-face-to-face methods, but other groups found that they had to use face-to-face, -face, especially for important information. Also, people were given enough information about their budgets, about the budgets of other programs, about who they were asking money for and for what, so that they could continue to make decisions because they had the information that they needed. They didn't fear that they were stepping on other people's uh, toes in that. And finally, they could make the decisions to represent the um, organization externally, and Caroline talk, uh, will talk a little bit more about that, but they could go out and talk to people, including the media or the press, in order um, to represent the agency because they understood what they were talking about and they didn't have to get approval to do that. Okay, the fourth area in, um, in the implementation was really clarifying roles. If people didn't understand their roles, uh, then again, it could throw off the system. And partly, this was defining responsibility, and it was defining accountability. I want to emphasize again that for most of these groups, the reason they went to a distributed leadership model is because they thought they would have more impact. And the way they had more impact was to be very clear about what people were responsible for and what they would be accountable for, which also took time. And so they created structures within the work to talk about accountability. Um, so I will give you an example. One of the groups that we um, highlight in the paper is um, We Make the Road New York, which is actually an interesting organization because it has it, it's an $8 million organization. It has, um, I'm not 
don't remember exactly, maybe 70 staff, uh, and they um, have three co-directors. They, they started with two co-directors, and then they merged with another organization, and they have three co-directors that each have their own domains. They talk frequently, these co-directors, but they have three co-directors. And then they have uh, teams uh, in each of their areas that make decisions. And um, when we thought, talked to one of the directors, he said, if there's not a clear driver, it can slow things down, and there can be a way that everyone lets themselves not mean the de meet the deadlines. So he talked about how mutual responsibility can be good in the sense that it can reinforce productive work, but it can also reinforce unproductive behavior if not one person is responsible when a goal is not met. So we want to emphasize that when you distribute leadership, it doesn't mean you don't have responsibility and accountability. In fact, I think that clarifying the roles made it easier for people to understand what they were accountable for, and it also helped move um, programs along and to, again, have greater impact. The fifth area um, in implementing uh, distributed and sometimes shared leadership was really rested with the executive director, the CEO, and the executive team. And that meant that they um, had power to make decisions, but they thought it was more important to let go of power than to keep power. Uh, so as one, um, as we say in the report, they control only what they felt they needed to control. And often that was very little. They, so um, in certain ways, we're saying it's a type of leadership. It's a type of leadership that leads to distributed leadership throughout the organization. So they could, um, they could step in and make decisions, but time after time after time, they couldn't. We had an example of one group that had divided uh, into um, teams to make decisions about uh, different parts of the organization, including um, their annual fundraiser. And he said that at first that team didn't believe, the CEO told us, that the team didn't believe that the CEO was not going to intervene in that decision. And he said, I had to convince them that though I am a very strong leader, I am not a controlling leader. I'm a very strong leader, but I'm not a controlling leader. And then he talked about what happened. They then came up with all these ideas um, about how to do the fundraiser. Uh, and the fundraiser raised more money that year than it had ever raised. It was entirely different than it had been in the years before. And he felt it was because he could let go of control. He could only think of it in the way he had al al always done it. But he, it didn't mean that he wasn't strong. He's still a very strong presence. If you meet him, you can feel it right away. But he, as he said, he didn't have to control that process, and he got more out of the process by letting go. So those are the five areas that we really highlight in the report as being important to implement distributed leadership. And we were going to go now to another poll question. Is that right? My, yes, the right I'm, <laughs> I'm and, going to start. And I'm going to give it to Caroline, yeah. Yeah, so I'm going to start in a second talking about some of the indicators of success um, that we saw from these organizations, things that they felt were going on. So we wanted you to answer this question before we get started, uh, which is, in my organization, uh, program staff can talk to the media uh, without prior approval, and it's a select all type situation. Individual projects can raise their own funds, um, and staff feels ownership over internal policy decisions. So any of those things that are true in your organization, uh, go ahead and click. We're getting some results here. And we asked a piece of this question a little bit earlier uh, from another angle, which was whether or not um, the ED is the only one who can speak. So now the question is on the other side, can the program staff speak without prior approval? Um, and we have I'll give you a couple more seconds here on this. Again, we have a very kind of staff-focused group. Let me go ahead and share these results. So you see here, um, 40% of you, a lot of you didn't feel that um, any of these really spoke to your organization. Um, but about a third of you felt that program staff could talk to the media without prior approval. Um, about a third, again, feeling that projects can raise their own funds. Um, and, and a bigger percentage feeling that staff felt ownership over internal policy decisions. Um, all three of these things were pretty true for the organizations that we spoke with um, about kind of the results they were seeing. 
uh, once they started implementing this, once they started allowing decision making to get pushed down, uh, what were they starting to see? So the first thing that we wanted to talk about was this concept that we keep talking about, power to decide on programs, including raising funds. The reason we found this so particularly interesting was because we were surprised at how much power people had in terms of developing relationships specifically with funders or the media. Um, I mentioned it a little bit earlier when I talked about values as being important as a foundation in that people could then make decisions um, about who to talk to, how far to take it, um, what was in line with the mission of the organization, etc. So overall, there were simply more decisions being made by people other than the CEO and the executive director, so things that you wouldn't commonly think falling into this group. Um, we went back to groups actually to verify what we were hearing because um, we were surprised by it. And one executive director talked to us about this sense of developing relationships with funders at the program level. And she basically talked about trusting staff to stop and check in in a couple of circumstances. So for instance, if they were developing a relationship with a funder in a conversation about um, uh, a certain grant, let's say, and it went beyond the scope of their program, or it started to become of a size that it would really impact the direction of the organization, she trusted that at that point that staff member would stop those conversations or hold off and come back and either check in with the other program directors or check in with her. Um, so that was where a sense of that trust came. It wasn't just, I'm hands off and we'll just see what happens. Um, it really came about in terms of trusting people to know where the level was and where the stop point was in those relationships and in those discussions. Um, so in the case of these organizations, fundraising and including budgetary discretion and how funds were spent, um, especially at the program level, were highly distributed. And there were certain elements in place from that foundation part that we were talking about, including those well-defined roles, internal information sharing, communication, trust, these things I'm talking about that are in place um, in order to uh, kind of build up the trust um, to allow people to do this. Let's get to the next one. So new ideas and innovation. And this is somewhat um, intuitive in terms of the results. This is one of the more intuitive results in that the more people you have involved in decision making and in information sharing, the more ideas you're going to have to sift through. Um, people were really excited about how much the, or the ideas spread through the organization, so the relationships between different um, program areas that may have been siloed before. Uh, people were excited about that. Um, and they were also excited about the number of frontline folks. So close folks closer to the ground um, and program staff working at that level who are able to spot new trends and patterns faster and really get those to the organization um, quicker and really have more ideas and innovation happening. So that was one of the most immediate effects that they saw and uh, that they were they excited about. All right, so the next thing we saw was more responsibility and responsiveness. And this is a little bit about um, Frances touched on this when she was talking about clarifying roles. One of the results that the people we spoke with found was that people began to take more responsibility for all the decisions in the organization. The buy-in was not only something that was required to start, but it's something that resulted from this process. So as more decisions were made and as people had more responsibility for those decisions, they really became more a part of the organization. Um, and they, you really could see that internally as well as externally. And I mean that in the sense that um, partnerships that were developed um, that I've mentioned before, policies that they were developing in the organization, people had more of an opinion um, and about those things. I have one question that's popped up. Um, how does the organization ensure that the same pool of funders is not being approached by different people from the same organization? And that was relating to the first indicator I had here. And that's something we went back and asked our interviewees because it was something we had been hearing as a question. And again, because of the systems they had set up around information sharing, so they had access to know who was developing um, relationships, which foundations were they talking to. And people were able to get that sense before they really dove into a relationship. So again, it's not a hands-off kind of um, laissez-faire, talk to who you want to, raise all the funds you can. It is more strategic when it plays out. Um, and again, it's because of that information sharing and because um, of the trust they have that people are going to check in with each other. Um, 
especially when uh, I think I hear a lot of people on the development side come back to me with um, the amount of time and effort that goes into a major ask from an organization, and I think there is fear around that being derailed. But that really doesn't happen in this case when people are sharing in that way. Okay, so the next thing that we saw was increased and diverse external representation. So again, this sense that um, this is based on the strong values in internal communications that people can use when evaluating their decisions about, again, partnerships, who to speak to, what they're saying. Um, and one organizational head told us that by not centralizing his communications, the programs in his organization were mentioned more times than if he had ever tried to control uh, the communications and the reach. Um, you know, and, and in fact, he was mentioned more than other organizations in his region who probably had bigger departments controlling that. Um, and he liked it. He attributed it to the fact that the staff could help him develop that message and weren't relying on him uh, to control it. So finally, the biggest indicator we saw, and the one that we mentioned first off um, as to why people started this process, um, was this issue of greater impact. All the people we spoke to, even some who were in the more initial stages of the process um, spoke about having greater impact. So growing programs, maintaining talent. I saw a couple of people when we were starting the webinar talk about um, what can they do to retain younger talent and get them more interested. That was one of those things people saw. Raising more funds, addressing new issues, um, creating new partnerships, and scaling work were some of the examples that people gave. Um, and yet one executive director expressed surprise that despite that impact and despite those results, it was still really hard to talk about what they were doing to funders and to get funders and sometimes boards and colleagues to recognize what they were doing and why that impact um, was happening. So given all that, we have one last poll. Oh, no, actually, this is not a poll question. We want to allow some time to answer the questions that you all have been asking um, as we've gone along. We want to spend a little bit of time on this, and I'm going to let Francis take over at this point. Um, before we wrap up and talk a little bit about the next steps we're interested in in terms of this work and get a sense from you um, where you would like to see this move and more information you would want. So I'm going to... We've been talking a lot about the practices of uh, distributed leadership and decision making. And you have your chat box and your question box there. And if you would type in your questions, we have about... So five to ten minutes to, um, for your questions before we wrap up. I wanted to, as you're typing in your questions, uh, I wanted to um, just emphasize something that Caroline uh, talked about in terms of raising money. One of the project directors, uh, one of the executive director CEOs that we talked with said that um, he had a program director that was, um, that was, not interested in raising money. As a matter of fact, he didn't want to come into the organization because he was afraid of raising money. And they worked together on a creative way that he could start raising money for his project. So in this instance, the executive director CEO wanted to support but wanted to distribute that responsibility to the program director who could raise money. And um, and it worked out you know, well. Uh, and the person did it, he said, and, and the, he had more ownership over the program because he had raised the money for the program. So I think there was a sense of supporting people to be able to do some of the things that we think of as only the uh, chief person doing. So what we'd like uh, you to do now is to type any questions that you have or comments about your own uh, work or your own organization that you'd like to share with uh, the other people on the call into the chat or um, question box. And uh, and then we want to start answering those questions. Again, we can't have you raise your hand. There's a great feature here of raising your hand, but with so many people, uh, that's a little bit difficult. Uh, and then Caroline and I will answer some of the questions. So what, so what questions or comments do you have um, that you would like to ask us? Um, and Caroline and I will try to answer those. Okay, so Francis, I'll start reading some of them out because um, I don't think you can see them. So one of the questions asked, and I think we've seen some of this, is um, an interest in how organizations handle the additional time required for communication um, and internal consultation with distributed leadership, so especially when staff are not all in the same location. Um, and so maybe we can talk about the rest of the question says, 
how to ensure the deliberations are inclusive but do not bog down the process, and how to ensure decision making occurs in a timely manner. So um, one of the things that we found in terms of the time is that was a trade-off that people talked about. And there were some decisions that had to be made very quickly. Actually, distributed leadership seemed to help a lot with quick decision making. In other words, people at various levels could make uh, quick decisions when needed. But when there were more complicated decisions to be made, they knew who to consult and when to consult them. That didn't seem to be the issue. The time investment seemed much more on the front end to make sure people were up to speed with all the information that they needed. Um, and so uh, that I mean, we were surprised. I, I thought that time and, and patience was a big issue all the way along. I think what took a lot more time was when a unit was making a decision, like if a team was making a decision. And usually that's where this idea of a driver or accountability setting out goals and deadlines was very important to that group. It didn't have to be given to somebody else to show that you were doing that, but you but, um as one executive director said, you know, he needed to push that responsibility to somebody in the group, and then they would be able to um, do that. And I'm going to just get off for one second while I get help with what I'm not seeing the questions. <laughs> um, so another question that came up was is um, whether or not this works for every organization, and if there's types of organizations for which the model would not work. And I thought I might take that as an opportunity to talk a little bit about why we spoke to organizations with 10 or more uh, staff members. And one of the things, because I also saw a, c a question about whether single person organizations um, can try this or try some of these techniques, which is a little bit harder when there's uh, one person. But we did speak with some groups who were highly volunteer based. Um, and so I want to say a couple things about size, and then I'll talk about maybe some organizations that might not work for. Um, so in small organizations, it's actually easier to do this, we found, because the number of per people are reduced and because um, there tends to be less formal structure already in those organizations. We were seeing lots of examples of people doing um, either consensus-based leadership. Um, we saw people who were really being led by their member leaders. So they would take basically votes every week at meetings about what they should do and how they should move forward. So we saw really kind of distributed and decentralized leadership in that way. Um, and so the reason we were looking at 10 is that in some of our work in the past, it's harder to translate these to organizations that either have um, really formal structures or uh, really uh, kind of stagnant cultures or strong cultures in which it's hard to change the way work gets done. Um, I would say certain organizations where we saw this working less um, was some of those multi-site. This isn't true of every multi-site organization, but some of the organizations that had developed either multi-state organizations um, with a national reach or, um, well, let's start with that, that had really centralized national offices that were kind of delivering the message, delivering the partnerships, delivering the funding relationships. And there was not a lot of um, room for those folks to take power over their own organizations. Having said that, there were some in which they made a decision to change that. Um, so we talked to one organization in which local chapters had a lot of power to decide to make those decisions um, about funding. Um, so I but get the go ahead. Yeah. Back just so you, so you know, Caroline. Sorry about that. Right. <laughs> um, um, I also just wanted to say that uh, several people talked about how they had a uh, um, they've been trying either co-directorships or leadership teams or distributive models. I want to give a shout out to our friends at the Southwest Organizing Project that we know are doing that. And we might talk about, at the end of the webinar, we're going to give um, information about how you can talk to us. But we might talk about having a conference call with people who are trying this so people can talk with each other rather than through a webinar process where we're giving you information, you can actually share information about how that's going. And I, um, I really appreciate, Tomas, uh, you asking about that. Um, and, and there's a way we could do that with everybody uh, post-call. So sorry to interrupt you, Caroline. I just wanted to make sure we got that in. Not at all. And I wanted to say one more thing. For, there are some people who are still having issues with sound. Um, and I've been told that if you use the phone to call in instead of your computer, that's resolving the issues. Um, so no, that's all I was going to say is that for some organizations, it's not going to work. Um, but for many of the reasons that we laid out before, so buy-in from staff and 
um, whether there's a room in the culture to do um, that. And uh, one person has mentioned uh, organizations that use sociocracy or dynamic governance as models for distributed leadership. And those are two great resources. We did a lot of reading, but um, that's added to our reading list. And we give it to you others to read, sociocracy and dynamic governance as models for distributed leadership. And we'll look at those. And, and we'll also post that on our website. Another person asked about um, how these findings relate to hiring practices and decisions. Um, and met, that we mentioned earlier that um, some of these people, uh, some of the people we spoke with look at whether folks will fit into the new culture um, and get along with folks, and is looking for some other lessons. Uh, one of the things that we saw, um, not that in this particular study, but one of the um, studies that we did prior to this um, around multi-generational leadership in organizations was one director used every um, interview and hiring kind of process, whether she hired people or not, to find out what levels of leadership they were interested in. So basically, she wanted everyone from the administrative assistants to the program directors to be interested um, in making those kinds of decisions, in being a leader someday, so that it wasn't in the sense, it's not quite the same thing as getting along with folks who are there. Um, but it's similar in the fact that it's somebody who's going to buy into the idea that they're going to be involved in decisions. Because some people, you know, had a hard time adapting to this uh, that we spoke with. So I think we should move on since we're getting towards the end of the webinar time. Um, and uh, before we sum up, we wanted to ask you what you think uh, would be helpful um, uh, to learn more about as we continue our work, we're curious from you, um, what what issues do you think would be useful um, to learn more about? Um, and we wanted you to select all that apply. We do this as a as a polling, but and we wanted to share it with others. Some people have asked us for more case examples. We have a few in the report, but um, we would like to know uh, we certainly would like to have more. And uh, people often ask what doesn't work as well as what does work. We we wanted to know if you wanted to know more about the definitions or terms, what they mean, um, ideas about talking to funders about alternative structures. We did hear a lot of pushback that funders and boards of directors had issues uh, related to this. And then um, whether how do you make the transition to distributed leadership structures. And then if you have others, will you just put them in the chat box? So we're just waiting for people to fill this out. And I think we have enough people that we can look at the results of the poll. Um, so uh, you can see that most of you would like case examples. The definitions don't mean as much to you or talking about uh, to funders. But the transition is an important issue um, um, for many of you. And um, some of the other things that are coming up, um, also, if you were only able to select one and you wanted to put something else, uh, go ahead and put that in the question chat box, and we'll see it. Yeah. OK. OK. And again, I'm having some trouble with the question chat box, so you can, <laughs> Caroline, I'm going to let you take that. Well, I'm going to just try to, uh, since we're almost at our ending point, um, talk a little bit about what we're thinking about doing next um, and to um, to um, hopefully uh, have others of you that are interested in this topic think about these issues uh, as well. The first thing we have uh, thought about is how do we develop a language. Um, since that wasn't that important to most of you, maybe that's something we won't do. But, but <laughs> we found that when we read the materials, people use the same words to mean different things. And it would help clarify what we're talking about if we had a shared language in this area. Um, we're also looking at what the practices that we came up with. We're looking at other practices. We'd like to hear more about the practices that you have. And we, uh, others of you that are doing research or uh, documenting these things, we'd like to share what you found in this area of distributed leadership, uh, things that you've read, uh, techniques that people have used. 
we find that all very useful. And um, it would be terrific if you would share those with you. And that if we could really document more um, what these uh, look like. Um, the third area is we have gotten a lot of pushback on the role of the board. We have to remember that boards of directors uh, hire the executive director. And since we talked about models that might look traditional that are actually distributed within the organization, how do you embed that in the organization, including in the board of directors? We found a mixed role for the board. For some uh, groups, having the, the board uh, be more hands-off worked better. And for others, having the board kind of oversee the distributed leadership process was very useful. And we'd like to know more about that and the role of the board. Um, we, are, we talked a lot about responsibility. We didn't actually interview staffers in these organizations. We interviewed the uh, a co-director or more than one co-director. We sometimes interviewed a senior person with an executive director. But to really talk about how accountability felt to staffers, I think we would need to talk with them about that and to learn more about their uh, opinions and how they see it increasing impact. Um, so that would be another area we're looking to explore. And then we talked in our poll question about what happens when there's a conflict. That's one of the things we really pressed our interviewees on. And uh, we felt we could have learned more about what happens when there's really um, decision-making problems. As one person said in their question to us, we have very people with very strong personalities. Um, and we all were co-directors. How do you deal with the conflicts that come up? And some people dealt with that through coaching. Uh, some people said that they just had very good relationships among the uh, co-directors. Some people felt that an executive director did step in when there was a um, conflict in terms of decision making and that that was a good thing. So we would like to know more about those issues. Uh, we would like to also know if you have information on any of these that you want to share with others, and we'll post that on our website. I want to so, say one last thing before we wrap up, Francis. I've yeah. seen some questions around what do you do in addition to the board, what do you do in more member-based organizations or volunteers? And I just wanted to add one example that we didn't share um, that actually does came, come out of Make the Road uh, as well as a couple other organizations we spoke with, um, but it isn't in the report. The, when leadership and decision-making was pushed down um, to the frontline level, what we found is a lot of folks with um, member organizations were able to really um, share that same strategy with uh, constituents that they were working with. So we saw it play out in two ways. One, that they actually ended up, some, in some cases, moving into the organization, either as staff members or as community leaders. Um, but it worked a little, it was part of those effects, but we didn't put it in because it was also probably uh, attributable to other factors, but it was part of the um, impact that they found them having. Right. So I think we are uh, one minute over time. We want to thank you. Uh, we want to tell you how to get in touch with us, which is on our next uh, slide. Um, uh, we will post a podcast of this on our website, www.buildingmovement.org. That's where you can also get the report. You can sign up for being on our mailing list. And if you have more information that you want to share, you can either send it to leadership at buildingmovement.org or either to me or Caroline. It's uh, my name, F. Kuhnreuter, at buildingmovement.org or C. McAndrews at buildingmovement.org. But if you can't remember or uh, know how to spell our names, just send it to leadership at buildingmovement.org. And thank you so much for attending today. Yep. We'd love to get your feedback. Thank and you. And finally, you'll receive an email to follow up as well. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.